James says, I'm debt free, 700 cash flow, looking to start IBC. How do I get started? James, I have a link in the description below. It says, ready to start your life insurance asset. Click here. That's one resource, okay, to start. I personally have two of the um, high cash value life insurance policies, one with Guardian, one with Mass Mutual. I went with IBC Global Incorporated. Steve Parisi, you could type that in. He has a YouTube channel, fantastic, transparent content. And uh, you can start learning. You can start getting illustrations made for you, have a conversation. I even encourage you to go and look at other resources. See who else is out there uh, talking about this and, and how they can, uh, how they do it. Because there's, there's many different ways to uh, practice the uh, private banking system or infinite banking concept. And you know what? We might as well, might as well break it down, right? We got 139 people in the house. This is wonderful. All right. So James, this is for you, buddy. Marketing term, infinite banking concept. Product, actual product name is whole life or indexed universal life, okay? That's the actual product name. This is a marketing term, infinite banking concept. A more generalization of all the terms would be high cash value life insurance. That would be a general term when discussing that concept, okay? So you have, so if you hear something like become your own banker, private banking, family banking, kingdom banking, cash flow banking, those are marketing terms. Actual product name, whole life, index, universal life. Got it, great, thanks. So now you have a decision as to um, how you wanna design your policy. So you have a couple of different options. In regards to the whole life option, Typically, anyone that any agent that I've met so far that promotes high cash value life insurance, they're using only mutual companies. They're only using mutual insurance companies. As far as I'm concerned, I haven't heard anyone on a big scale do stock companies. Only mutual in regards to whole life. Now, in addition to the insurance agents that are using whole life to teach their clients to have high cash value life insurance, they're not only using a mutual life insurance company, but they're designing it a specific way. And here are the, ow, just hit my finger. And here are the options, all right? You can either do a 90-10 split, 80-20, Seventy thirty, or sixty forty. Anything past sixty forty is a dangerous territory. That's uncharted territory. I would not venture into this space. Now I've had multiple clients, multiple clients that were sold fifty fifty splits by an insurance agent that preached high cash value life insurance, which is unfortunate because it's a bit unethical. They could have went higher and have given more cash. The whole point is cash value, not really life insurance. We don't really care about this. We care about that if you're looking at high cash value life insurance, okay? So, why on earth would an insurance agent design a 50-50 split design? The only reason why, the only reason that I've come up with so far is this wonderful word called commission, right? Can I spell commission right? Oh, Lord, have mercy. 
commission. Yep. An insurance agent gets paid off premium dollars. Okay. Commissions, primary source of income is coming from premium dollars. So if I design you a 50-50 split, right? Take my example for, you know, my 70 grand. If I give $70,000, right, to an insurance agent, divide that by two, he puts $35,000 in freaking premium on a 25-year-old. Why the hell would you do that, right? Really think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Put it through your head, okay, 50-50 split. Insurance agent gets paid off what? He makes money off commissions. Where's his commissions deriving from? Premium dollars, okay? Now, insurance agent might collect a 90% commission off that number. 35,000 times 90% is a, is a $31,500 $31, paycheck. If I would have went with, you know, some dude or woman that designed me a 50-50 split. That's about how much commission they get. How much do I get in starting cash value? Somewhere around that number probably, right? Because the other 35K goes into, you know, the cash value. But there's also, you know, there could be a term rider in there. You got the PUA fee, right? You got, you know, you got all the, you know, there's costs. There's cost. So with high cash value, the goal is to reduce your cost, maximize cash. But I'm just showing you the options. You get to decide where you want to land on the spectrum. I don't think there is a, uh, a terrible, uh, I don't think there's terrible people out there. Um, maybe that's just me being naive. But I will say personally, Anything past 60, 40, I'm not going to play with it. I, I just don't teach my clients that. I don't think it's ethical. If we start going 50, 50, guess what the conversation becomes about? Life insurance. It becomes about more life insurance. You get more death benefit, less cash value. More death benefit, less cash value. That, that's the only two places money can go is cash value or death benefit, right? Premiums, essentially, premium dollars. Right? So you can do a 60 40 split, 70 30, 80 20, 90 10. Obviously, if you do the math, you do a 90 10, you're most likely going to have the most amount of cash value out of all these other guys, all these other options. Okay? The only reason why 90 10 would not make sense, in my opinion, is if somebody is looking to do long funding. Right? So if you're looking at Say my example was 70,000 for seven years. What if I said 70,000 for 30 years? Well, I would want to be somewhere around here where I would do a 75 25 split. Okay? The reason why is your MEC limit has to be higher. The more money you put into a policy, the more death benefit is going to be required and the higher the mech limit has to be you need to have mech space you want to over inflate the mech to drastically reduce your possibilities your chances of creating a modified endowment contract the goal is to not create a mech the best way to determine whether your policy will become a mech or not is to do a mech test so you can ask your agent to do a MEC test, right, is one thing. Um, and then, well, essentially you're looking at the guarantees only, right? So you can say, okay, well, based on the guaranteed growth of the policy, putting in 70K for 30 years at whatever MEC limit it is, does it become a MEC based off the guarantees? If it does not become a mech off the guarantees, well then now that provides that safety net. It's like, okay, it's not gonna create a mech because off the guarantees, um, when I fund the policy, I have plenty of mech space. So 
if the dividend rate for in in 2019 was 6% and then it drops to 5.8 in 2019 and then 2020 COVID hits so it drops to 5.7 and then the economy is still going down or whatever there's still a lot of employment so the, the the dividend rate keeps going down and keeps going down the the furthest it can go down is the floor rate the four percent so that's the best way to determine whether your policy will become a mech it's not the split per se it's the mech limit where did they set the mech and for the funding period so that's some good information ask your insurance agent you know um, and you'll get their, you know, their, their feedback and they'll maybe coach you and things like that. So that's with the whole life, right? Those different options, 90, 10, 80, 20, uh, 75, 25, 70, 30, 60, 40. Don't go past 60, 40 in my humble opinion, right? Me personally, I don't go past 75, 25 in terms of how I design my personal policies and policies that my clients uh, ask for. I don't see the value in going that deep on the split, um, but I could be wrong, right? I'm 25 years old, I could be wrong, and I'm happy to be wrong. I would love to be wrong, I wanna be wrong, so that I can learn what truth is. So that I can say, okay, well, after years of doing that, it actually was wrong. So you know what? Now I'm going to live the rest of my life doing it this way. Okay. So now in regards to IUL, um, I don't know how the split works. It's a little tough. It's a little tough. But I have been uh, looking at, I had one agent design me a policy from Pacific Life, but I got a little cold feet because they have a lawsuit. Um, that, that company. So I got a little cold feet. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to do it. I don't know if I'm going to do it. Uh, IULs in general, there's a big lawsuit against IUL designs in general, um, which kind of gave me some, you know, a little cold feet in the way that insurance agents were uh, presenting illustrations. Okay. So the only diff main difference between the IUL and the whole life is, is this word index, right? It's still a permanent life insurance policy. It comes with cash value, grow money. But the idea is that your money would grow way faster, way faster, right? You can earn, I don't know, 20% or 15% or 22%, and it's all tax-free. It's a wonderful story. Problem is, look at the stats. Unfortunately, a lot of these policies blow up in the later years. So. If you're going to use, if you're going to go with IUL, um, the only person I'd recommend uh, so far, this YouTube channel is Oregon Cashflow Pro. You can look him up. I like how he presents IUL. Okay, I don't have an IUL myself, but um, you know, I, I was going to obtain. I'm, I am going to obtain one for the hell of it. Um, just so that I can have the policy myself and track it myself and say, okay, here's my, you know, more, you know, uh, structured opinion around it because now that I you know, have one. But until then, I'm just looking at as many facts as I possibly can around that product. So you got whole life, right? All the different split designs you can go with. You got IUL terms of high cash value life insurance and then you have um, premium financing so that's the other option in the game premium financing in a nutshell the way premium financing works is they'll either take a whole life policy or more commonly from what I've seen so far an IUL policy you put in a certain amount say 50k a year and then a bank will match or put in more money than what you're putting in right premium financing so you're financing your policy you're putting in a certain amount and the bank is going to also put in 
a bunch of money into your policy. The idea is that your money would grow exponentially over a period of time. The bank then comes back, I don't know, 10 years later, maybe 15 years later, and they say, okay, you got to pay us everything we paid you into your policy plus interest. So the bank gets their money, you pay them back in full plus interest, and then you have a fully functional, super big, fat policy that you can live off of, okay? And from what I've seen so far, I've seen 10 pays or uh, 5 pays, 15 pays, and the bank funds it for a certain amount of years while you fund it for a certain amount of years and then stops. I'm learning about that right now. I'm, I'm also working with a gentleman uh, that is, you know, talking about premium financing. So those are the different options. At the end of the day, get educated, right? Check it all out. I would borrow from high interest credit card to fund policy, to take a loan, the policy to pay back the credit card, then use tax return to pay off policy loan. Great way to start IBC. Kevin, Kevin's going deep on us. Kevin's going deep on us. I'm not that smart. Kevin's pretty smart. So he, he's, going, he's going deep on that. That's a little tough for me. Again, uh, when it comes to leveraging, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to leveraging, me personally, me personally, you, you, you are the authority over your own life. But me personally, this is my special number. I'm not going to leverage more than 66% of what I have. I'm going to evaluate my finances. Does it make sense for me to borrow more money to start a policy? In some cases, sure. Right? I've taught it to my clients. It's worked effectively in some cases. In some cases, it does not. Right? I know when I first started my policy, yes. Did I use debt? Yes. It made sense? Yes. I did the numbers? Yes. Why not 67%? It's just a rule. It's just a rule. That's it. It's something that I picked up a while ago and I said, shoot, not so bad. Now, do I go above 66%? Yes. The most I will go is 80. That's how I violate my rule. If I'm going to violate my rule, it's because I'm getting a significant return on cash, a significant cash flow gain by paying something off, or an extremely large amount of interest savings, or all three. Okay? That's when I violate my own rule. 